Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. And uh, I would like to welcome you all for the 28th session of the online Optom learning series. Do let me just uh, introduce uh, the speaker for today. Uh, today we have Mr. Shukri Rafiuddin. Uh, he has finished his bachelor's from the University Technology Mara in Malaysia in 2010. Uh, currently, he owns and runs a primary eye care center with around five outlets across Malaysia. He is also actively involved as an optometrist advocacy and currently holds offices at the Public Health Committee member for the World Council of Optometry and also is a very active member for the Asia Pacific Council of Optometry as an exco. He also holds a position at the Association of Malaysian Optometrists as the National Secretary. And today he's going to talk to us about his experience as an optometrist in the field of electrophysiology for vision. So without further ado, let's welcome a researcher, a clinician, and a lecturer today for us who will brief us on the insights of the electrophysiology as an optometrist. So uh, welcome you, Mr. Shukri. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Fakhruddin, uh, for the kind introductions. So hello, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, you guys are doing well. Uh, I'm not sure whether you are currently in uh, lockdowns in your houses or you are currently at your practices, uh, able to practice. But here, we, I'm from Malaysia. Um, uh, so we have been uh, currently uh, already out of our lockdown uh, for the COVID-19. So, Today, um, I will give you some insights uh, on electrophysiology uh, of vision. Uh, as an optometrist. So uh, before that, um, if you guys are on Facebook, you can uh, go to Facebook and search for me. Uh, my profile name is Shuk Rafi, S-Y-U-K space R-A-F-I, Shuk Rafi. So, What is electrophysiology of vision, guys? Electrophysiology of vision is a study of electrical activity in the retina and its central connections. So this electrical activity in the retina and the visual pathway is actually the inherent property of the nervous systems, which actually remains electrically active at all times. So this means that uh, the electrical activity in our eyes uh, runs all the times, even during our sleep and during uh, unconscious. And this uh, electrical activity actually differs uh, with different stimulation. So uh, higher or brighter stimulations to the eyes will, will give a higher degree of activity. There are a few branches of electrophysiology of visions. The three main branches of electrophysiology of visions is uh, ERG, electroretinography, Electrooculography, EOG, and visual evo potential, VEP. So I will be talking on these three branches of uh, electrophysiology of issues today, just uh, a little bit for each of them. So the first one is the electroretinography, ERG. So ERG is the measure of the produced by the retina when it's stimulated by the light of adequate intensity. So the electrical responses is actually a composite uh, activities from the retinal pigment epitheliums from the photoreceptors and ganglion cell. So you capture this electrical activity from the cells, from RPE, from photoreceptors and ganglion cells, and you measure this electrical activity using the ERG. And ERG have many types of uh, uh, devices, uh, mainly, um, I, I will be talking only two main uh, types of ERG today, which is full-field ERG and multifocal ERG. There are also uh, focal ERG, pattern ERG, photopic negative ERG, so many uh, other types of ERG. So before we proceed to the full-field ERG, 
I would like uh, you guys know that there are procedures involved when you perform ERG. I'm not uh, familiar on how you guys are trained with electrophysiology of visions, but me myself back in Malaysia, uh, it is not a formal training. Uh, basically, I perform electrophysiology because uh, of the research project that I that I done back in, during my undergraduate studies. Until then, until that I continue my study, uh, that I further uh, my my research work in electrophysiology. So I'm not sure whether you guys have any formal training. So I'm going to introduce to you about the procedures of ERG. So ERG is performed by giving stimulus. Uh, to the eyes using the Gunsfeld uh, dome or through the strobe light source. So you give flashes of light to the eyes using this uh, Gunsfeld and then you capture the uh, electrical responses uh, of the retina using the electrode that is placed near to the cornea. There are a few types of electrodes available in the market and I mostly use the DTI electrode as you can see on the right lower part of the uh, slides. Aside from the procedures involving the, the, the instruments, involving the electrodes and the guns valves, there are also pre patient preparations for ERG. You will need to clean and scrub the skins involved uh, of ERG, whereby the electrodes touch the skin. So you need to clean and scrub the patients, as well as all patients that going for ERG needs to be dilated. Their pupil needs to be dilated. Yeah. And then thirdly, the electrode placement for this ERG needs to be very concise, need to be placed at a correct locations so that the measurements is okay. And then lastly, that ERG needs to be performed either through light adaptations or dark adaptations. It's for light adaptations, you need to make sure that the patient is in a light rooms for about 10 minutes before you perform ERG and for dark adaptations you need to make sure that the room is fully dark for 20 minutes and then you perform ERG on the patients. Why there are light and dark adaptations? It's because for light adaptations you're going to measure the cone photoreceptors responses and for the dark, uh, dark adaptations you are going to measure for the roads photoreceptors. So this is among uh, equipments that I use uh, in my research lab. Uh, as you can see, I use uh, Espeon E2 electrophysiology systems with uh, colored domes uh, that is available in my research lab. So this dome gives flashes of light to the, to the eyes and then the electrodes will record the response of the retina. Okay, so this is how the setups of the patients. As you can see, I am using uh, electrodes uh, called DTL electrodes. So this DTL electrode is actually a very fine uh, track that I put at the bulbar conjunctiva, at the lower part of bulbar conjunctiva across the, across the eye. So these fine electrodes will capture the electrical activity that happens at the back of the eye, at the, at the retina. And when it's captured, it will send to the to the to the ERG processes, and it will translate into the uh, recordings or the components. So for full field ERG, uh, there are two basic components or two main basic components. Actually, there are many other components involved in full field ERG, but these are the two that is uh, very main to the ERG, full field ERG, which is a wave which is uh, initial negative response. So the first depolarizations of the, ret of the retina, and this comes, A wave comes from the photoreceptors. Yeah? So the photoreceptors is the one that's giving out A wave. And then we have B wave, which is a last positive wave that comes after the A wave. And this comes from the cells, uh, which is the Mueller cells and bipolar cells. So what is the application of fulfill ERG? Well, one of the things that you can do fulfill ERG is for those people that is have presence of dense opacities in their media. So for these patients, for this type of patients, you might not be able to see their retina using the conventional fundoscopy. 
using the uh, biomicroscope, for example. So you want to know whether the cells are okay or not. So you can perform full field RG to the patients, but you must show the patient with a bright stimulus so that the response can record the retina. So other applications of full is the diagnosis on prognosis of retinal disorders. As you, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, ERG records the responses of the cells. So the photoreceptors, you can, can see the response of the root uh, cells. You can see the response of the cone photoreceptors. You can see the response of the ganglion cells, for example. So when you able to detect to determine the responses of these cells, you can diagnose and prognose the retinal disorders that happen to the patients. For example, for labus amaurosis, ERG is actually the primary diagnostic role. So when a child is suspected of having labus amaurosis, ERG should be included in the examinations to determine whether this child is actually having labus amaurosis or not. Other than that, ERG can also be used as diagnostic roles, including for choroideremia, gyrate atrophy, pathological myopia, and retinitis pigmentosa. It is very interesting to note that for juvenile diabetes, which uh, five years or longer, people with these uh, diabetics for five years or longer, is actually, if you perform ERG to these patients, you actually can identify whether they are at risk for developments of proliferative retinopathy. Yeah. So fulfill ERG can actually determine whether these patients are at risk to develop pro pro proliferative retinopathy. Okay, so that is fulfill ERG. Now it comes to the multifocal ERG, MF ERG. So this is the setups in my lab. Uh, when I perform a uh, multifocal ERG. So as you can see, the setup for the electrodes at the face of the patients is still the same, just like the full field ERG. But uh, compared to the full field ERG that we have a, uh, a gunstep bowls in front of the patients, we have a very big screen in front of the patient for the multifocal ERG. So what happens uh, by having these huge screens in front of the, of the patients? So this is the recordings of the patients. So when I perform the ERG, as you can see, there are hexagons on the screens, uh, minimums of 61 hexagons, and you can put as many hexagons as possible on the screens, and the screen will change from black and white to black again uh, for about 30 seconds. So each of these hexagons represent different locations of the retina and that's why it is called multifocal ERG because you can detect multi locations of the retina responses of different locations inside the retina multifocal ERG is actually the same as a full field ERG recordings you have a wave and b wave as well but because it is uh, recorded as a huge responses is actually uh, mathematical correlations that you can detect from this uh, multifocal ERG. So this is the device that you use uh, to record the multifocal ERG. And this is among the responses that we receive uh, when we perform multifocal ERG on different patients. You can see in in the slides that for patients with, for example, retinitis pigmentosa, A and B, you can see that there are flat lines uh, for the wavelengths of the patients in different location of the retina. So you know which of the locations inside the retina that is affected by the retinitis pigmentosa. As for the cone dystrophy in the C picture, you can see because cone are mainly at the fovea, at the macula. So the the wavelength at the center of the retina is lower compared to the peripheral retina and for the stargardt disease whereby the macula the cells are missing the photoreceptors are missing at the center you will see that there are flat lining of the wavelength at the 
central retina. So this is also some of the representations uh, of the multifocal ERG. We can map the retina accurately using the multifocal ERG. So what is the application of multifocal ERG? So many. Uh, you can detect macular apotis, you can take you can detect glaucoma, you can detect the diabetes retinopathy, retinitis pigmentosa, macular degeneration, stagat disease, cone dystrophies, uh, acute zonal occult retinopathy, and central serous retinopathy using the multifocal ERG. Okay, so next you can see in the slides, this is a picture of a patient's whereby we perform electrooculogram, EOG. So these patients are actually uh, moving uh, his eyes from left to right from and from right to left repeatedly. So what is actually electrooculogram? Electrooculogram is actually a clinical measure of integrity of the retinal pigment epithelium layer in which we measure the resting potential of the eye because we already know that the cornea is actually positive and the retina is actually negative. So when the eyes are moving, right to left, left to right, so there will be uh, different potentials between this cornea and retina. And we measure these differences in full dark adapted and full light adapted conditions. And these results are interpreted as Arden ratio. Arden ratio is the largest peak to throw amplitudes in light and is divided by the smallest peak to throw amplitude in the dark. So by having this other ratio, you will know what is the integrity or what is the conditions of the RPE in the eyes. So the applications of EOG is related mainly to the uh, RPE, uh, for example, for the RP and for the hereditary, hereditary de degenerations, for vitamin A deficiency, uh, as well as retinal detachment, toxic retinopathies and retinal vascular occlusions. So as a general rules, those conditions which cause a reduction in size of B wave in ERG also produce reduction in value of Arden ratio because B wave comes from the ganglion cells. B wave of ERG comes from the ganglion cells as well as the connective tissue, which is nearer to the RPE. So that's why if you detect uh, reductions in B wave in ERG, you might as well detect reductions in the value of Arden ratio. And in certain conditions, EOG is more sensitive than ERG. For example, in patients with vitelliform macular degenerations, fundus flavi maculatus, generalized dursens, which is often shown as a striking ERG re EOG reductions compared to the normal ERG values. Okay, so next. It comes to the visual evoke potentials, the third category of electrophysiology. So VEP is recorded by the patient sitting about one meter apart from the screens. And visual evoke potential is actually a measure of the visual contact responses, visual pathway responses, in which we will show the patients with uh, different patterns uh, in the screen. So the eye will capture the image in the screens and then as you can see, the electrode is not placed at the cornea. The electrode is not placed at the front of the face, but uh, at the back of the head. Yeah. So the electrode is actually placed at the visual cortex. So VEP is a recording of electrical potential changes produced in the visual cortex. Yeah. And it is macula dominated. Yes, because ma the macula is the the main uh, location in which the, the objects are captured and, and translated and sent to the visual cortex. So VEP is the only objective technique that is available to assess clinically the functional state of the visual system beyond the retinal ganglion cell. So for retinal ganglion cell, for retina, you can use uh, different methods aside from electrophysiology. You can use fundoscopy, you can use OCT. But for the visual pathway and for visual cortex, you cannot assess the functional state of uh, visual cortex or visual pathway aside from using VEP. So VEP is the only options that you have to assess this. 
So what is the applications of PEP? Mostly we are looking for the optic nerve diseases. Uh, for example, for compressive optic nerve lesions, uh, it is usually associated with reductions in the amplitude of VEP without much latency. So the response, the amplitudes uh, of the VEP is reduced, but the responses times that takes for the compressive optic nerve lesions is usually uh, normal. And for the, we can also use VEP during the orbital and neurosurgical procedures in which you can continuously record the optic nerve functions uh, using the VEP because you will able to prevent uh, damage to the nerve during the surgical manipulations because you are showing the VEP patterns to the patients uh, during that time. So you will know if there are any changes, if there are any changes to the uh, patterns of VEP, uh, recorded VEP, so that you, you, sh you will know that, oh, there are some problems when you perform the, the surgical manipulation to the nerve. So what is other application for VEP? You can also use VEP to measure VA uh, in infants, mentally retarded and aphasic patients, uh, because VEP is actually assess the integrity of macula and visual pathway. So it can give you the rough estimate of VA objectively. You can also detect malingerous and hysterical blindness using VEP because pattern evoked VEP amplitude and latency can be altered by voluntary changes in the fixation patterns or accommodations. So this is for malingerous. For those with hysterical blindness, we can detect them by having or, or by having the result of the VEP, which is absence in the first half, but the second half of the of the VEP. VEP is normally normal. So guys, um, why we are using electrophysiology? We are using the visual electrodiagnostic in clinical investigations. Basically, visual electrodiagnostic testings provide examinations at cellular levels. So there is no other examinations that is can measure the layers of the retina as accurate as the electrophysiology, as well as to measure the visual pathway and visual cortex, as good as the VEP. And the clinical applications for visual electrodiagnostics is very broad. As you can see, uh, I already mentioned to you, there are different types of uh, diseases, many ocular diseases that you can detect using the visual electrodiagnostics. And you can also use uh, electrophysiology for diagnosis and to determine the prognosis of the patients because you will know whether these patients will have possibility or chance to recover or perhaps no chance for recovery. And lastly, why we use this visual electrodiagnostic in clinical investigations is that there are promising results in early research in which we can use electrodiagnostic to detect early changes in the retina and perhaps we can prevent changes to the retina. For example, there are a study a few years back in which uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, can be detected earlier in patients with diabetics. So even though the patient is not yet having diabetic retinopathy, but changes at the cellular levels, we'll be able to predict that these patients are going to have diabetic retinopathy in future. So, as an optometrist, uh, if you become an electrophys electrophysiologist, what, need, what you need to, uh, to know, what is important that you need to know? The first one, if you become an electrophysiologist as an optometrist, is that you need to deeply understand the anatomy, physiology, and pathology of the eyes and visual pathway. Because electrophysiology involves so many areas and you are also looking into a very small details of the eyes, which is the cells and layers of the uh, eyes. So basically it helps you to really, really understand the anatomy, physiology, and pathology of the eyes and visual pathway. And by doing electrophysiology, you will be also very fluent in the procedures involving the equipments, patient, and processes. 
So that will be really helpful because you know what to do before, during, and after the uh, procedures. And as electrophysiologists, you will be able to precisely interpret the data, especially because you need to filter out noises. So those bad data, you can filter out the bad data and you will be able to correctly choose the values so that your result, your interpretation, interpretations of uh, electrophysiology will be good and these results can turn out to be uh, a diagnosis for you. So what is the benefits uh, if we optometrists become an electrophysiologist? Um, first one is that it is actually a continuous le learning, especially on the deeper knowledge of ocular disease. Back in 2008, when I first started involved with electrophysiology, I am uh, I the diseases that I come across when I read uh, the literature review is is very rare to me. But actually, in electrophysiology, the diseases that you detect using them is actually very normal, or you, that usually that you use. And for electrophysiologists, as an optometrist, you will have the benefits of knowing the advanced technology because electrophysiologists involve very advanced technology. So if you have uh, this knowledge of advanced technology, you will be able to you know, uh, predict the future and know what's going to happen. And as I mentioned in the summary of my presentations, um, Electrophysiology also opens the possibility of our collaboration as optometrists, particularly with ophthalmologists. Because as optometrists, when you perform uh, electrophysiology, we'll know certain things. You can interpret data that sometimes the ophthalmologist is not able to. So if you are an electrophysiologist, you will be able to help the ophthalmologist to inter interpret data, to detect the diseases, and to diagnose. So of course, still will help you not only uh, as an optometrist, but as well for your future career. And if you become an electrophysiologist uh, as an optometrist, it also become your specialization and give recognitions to you. And lastly, as an optometrist, which is an op electrophysiologist, you will be, be very brave and confident because Electrophysiology involves lots of things, involves lots of procedures. And uh, one of the things that is interesting is that, uh, for example, if you want to perform ERG, you need to dilate uh, pupils. So for example, in Malaysia, uh, we in Malaysia, optometrists in Malaysia, we don't have, have access to drugs, to, to, to therapeutic drugs. But when I perform electrophysiology, I have access to drugs and I am more confident to dilate uh, the eye, the patients of the, the the eyes of the patients, compared to my colleagues. So, a uh, little bit of uh, organizations that involved with electrophysiology of visions. It is called uh, ICEF, International Society for Clinical Electrophysiology of Vision. So, if you are interested uh, to become uh, an electrophysiologist, or you you are doing some uh, study on electrophysiology of visions. I will suggest you to go to their websites to learn a lot about electrophysiology. They have lots of resources for uh, electrophysiology. And with that, uh, I thank you for your for you for your uh, attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, I return the floor to uh, Mr. Fakridi. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shukri. I think this was the uh, I don't think you can put it any easier than this, what you helped us to recall or recap our ideas and our uh, background knowledge about ERG, EOG, and VEP. I think uh, everybody was overwhelmed by the, by the way you put up this talk so that we could actually know a lot of details. So thank you very much. And uh, there are a couple of questions. So I'll just read them out for you and uh, probably you can give your uh, suggestions for it. Uh, the first one is, uh, 
about pediatrics so what do you think uh, is the youngest age where we can perform an erg or a vep and are there any normative data available for that particular age group okay so for erg and vep you can actually perform erg and vep for um, all range of uh, ages from the youngest okay. babies to the oldest uh, people um, however uh, of course different uh, age range will result in different uh, values so as for the second questions any normative available for the same basically for for example uh, in malaysia uh, back in 2008, I am the one that is doing the research on uh, getting the normative value for Malaysian populations because different mm -hmm. populations, different age, in fact, different races have uh, different uh, normative values. So uh, I'm not sure um, for, uh, for example, in India, whether you have the normative value for, for India, but um, some of the some of the countries have their own normative values then then you need to look up into in the literature uh, literature review yeah and probably this would open doors for people who want to take up research if there is no normative data as you said uh, there's yeah. very less people doing electrophysiology and that would be one of the research area where people can look at right yes uh, yes and is there any chances of any false positive or any misdiagnosis uh, in terms of ERG? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, in terms of false positive, uh, most of the times, um, false positive did not happen in uh, electrophysiology, in ERG, for example, because the machines uh, is able to differentiate the, the, the wavelengths of the A wave and B wave uh, very accurately. Uh, so for misdiagnosis, it's actually on the side of the humans because we are the one that is interpreting the data. So if we, if we for example, see the, the values of the A wave, and different, A wave and B wave differently from, for example, from the normative values, we might suspect some things and we might say that this is the disease, but somehow is actually represent a different disease. So to, to avoid uh, misdiagnosis in ERG, normally we also perform other tests as well. For example, we, of course we do, uh, if possible, we, we will do the funders or we will do the OCTs and other tests as well. So that's a really good uh, question, Dashen. Yeah, okay. And uh, any limitations in performing uh, ERG or EOG? Okay, um, for ERG limitations, I think if you have a very, very dense uh, cataract or very uh, opaque cornea, you will not be able to perform uh, ERG as well as EOG because it involves uh, flashes of light. Even though if you give, if you give uh, very extreme bright lights to the patient, but if the, they are very dense cataract or the, the, the corneal is very opaque, then the patient still not be able to see the, uh, the, the flashes of light. So you will not be able to record any responses from the retina. So that is uh, one of the limitations. Uh, faculty. Okay. And are there any recent advances in electrophysiological tests where we can localize the lesion along the visual pathway in different field loss? So by just doing uh, these tests, can we actually okay. determine that where is the problem in the visual pathway? All right. Um, actually, DEP, visual evoke potentials, mm -hmm. <coughs> can be recorded uh, using two channels. Uh, I actually skip this um, explanation because I want to make it very easier for you guys. Uh, yeah. Basically, VP can be recorded for right eye and left eye, and we can uh, detect the, the lesions uh, of the retina if we use two channels. We record at two different locations at the visual cortex. So we can know whether it is a 
temporal or national relation which are locations of the but it's not it's not as accurate as um, for example visual fields uh, test but uh, it at least gives you uh, some some insight into which are locations of the uh, lesions happening uh, as the recent advances advances i think um the the area in vep is uh i think is is a limit there there is a limit for the for the advances currently whereby i think the the best way that we can see is through using the two channels of vep we we, we can mm -hmm. see or we can detect uh, different lesions yeah okay and how does uh, vep help us to determine the va is there any uh, specific way we need to calculate or uh, the interpretation gives us the estimated visual acuity ah yes okay um for vep uh, if you want to to check for the to determine va or to estimate va because you will not be able to correctly determine the va you estimate the va by giving uh, stimulus in terms of gratings. So there are black and white gratings in the, on the screens, which will change color, black to white, white to black. So different uh, degree of gratings, uh, different size of gratings will reflect uh, different VA. For example, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, I can't recall, I think 20 degree of uh, gratings 20 degree size of the grating, just like the Snellet chart, 20 degree, 20 degree of arc, uh, represents about uh, six, nine uh, VA. Okay. So different gratings will give or will be able to help you to, to estimate the VA of, the, of your patients. Okay, so the grading means the optokinetic nystagmus or the Taylor equity chart, the gradings uh, which are there. So similar kind of gradings are shown and then the responses are recorded is that is that uh, correctly right. understood yeah that's right that's right yeah okay and could you also give a brief on eog i think you have covered this but probably yeah. can you just summarize eog as hold on i i'm going to show the the yeah the okay so EOG, electrooculogram, is actually the measure of the retinal pigment epithelium, RPE. So we can be able to, to see the response from the RPE uh, layer because there are differences between the positive, the cornea, and the negative uh, retina. So when the eyes are moving from right to left and left to right, there are different action potentials involved because of the positive and negative uh, locations of the of the cornea and retina so these different different action potentials that is uh, stimulated will give rise to what we call arden ratio so rpe will respond uh, differently when we move the eyes yeah from right to left left to right so these movements will result in arden ratio and this arden ratio is the one that will be a, will help us electrophysiologists to determine whether uh, we able to detect uh, RPE problems. So I hope that uh, make it a little bit clearer to- Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I think the next question is about VEP, which we have already uh, answered and covered. Uh, the following, we'll just take the last two questions. Uh, do you know about any recent articles which you can share on VEP for visual impairment? Is there any, any, research? any uh, research? Um, to be honest, for VEP, I am I am not that uh, I haven't come across with any 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 uh, VEP papers on visual impairments for recently. Uh, okay. This is mainly because I mainly I mainly do research uh, using ERG and uh, multifocal ERG. But if you would like to. I will be able to help you to, you know, to to share it uh, later if if you if okay. you want to. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. No problem. That would be great. And do you know about any uh, fellowships? I know this question is basically pertaining to Indian population, but uh, do you think that overall, in general, globally, there are some fellowships available for people who would like to be interested in electrophysiology? Uh, 
Do you have any yes. idea on that? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Basically, these uh, fellowships, uh, as I uh, mentioned to you guys just now, you can find out about all of this in the ISAF uh, website. Okay, mm -hmm. in the ISAF website. So normally they will post up uh, these fellowships on electrophysiology in this because electrophysiology is a very uh, close knit community. There are very few of us, not not many of us. So if yeah. there are any any openings or any uh, fellowship, we we normally put up in the in the website. Yeah. Okay, so I think in pertaining to India, if you ask me, uh, I know one person who does electrophysiology in India, which is Dr. S. S. Bhatti. It's in uh, Mumbai, India. So if you are from Bombay, then probably you can contact him and he might be able to channel you to a proper uh, fellowship centers if that helps. But as, as uh, Mr. Shukri mentioned that this particular field is a very close community, I think this uh, website uh, would give you a lot of detailed information on the openings or the institutions where uh, fellowship, fellowships are available. So probably you can you can just uh, Google up this website and uh, uh, get your information. So thank you very much, Mr. Shukri. I think uh, it was a wonderful session and uh, we all enjoyed it thoroughly, uh, definitely. And uh, uh, thanks for making uh, electrophysiology easy for us. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Fakhruddin, for inviting me to share this. Yeah, yeah, most welcome, most welcome. And before we leave for today, uh, just let me share my screen and let you all uh, know about the session which we have uh, on next week. So we have a session on next week which is on dispensing optics. And uh, we have uh, Optom Anita Arvind from India and she will brief us about the dispensing solutions for anisometropic prescriptions and she will also share with us some case studies so please tune in next week saturday 11 a.m indian time and 1 30 afternoon malaysian time until then stay home stay safe and see you all again next week bye